Drink beer. Think beer. You're listening to Brew Blood. Pretty women make us buy beer. Ugly women make us drink beer. That from uh, former Polk High School quarterback Al Bundy. An old school favorite show. Used to enjoy it quite a bit. I did. I wonder how well it holds up now. I I also quite enjoyed it, but uh, I'm thinking it won't hold up as well. Do you think it might be a little uh, shocking even now, some of the <laughs> things they get away with? I, I remember it seemed very shocking at the time. Yeah, it was very shockery. Yeah, it was just, It was a lot of uh, two in the pink, one in the stink to uh, societal. Very to much. Soci- to societal? To society. To societal. To societal. <laughs> yeah, I wonder how well it holds up. I would be curious... <laughs> By curious to go back and find out yeah. if it still holds up. Extremely by curious. It seems like, especially in the PC bro culture we're living in now, yes. that we were we seem to get I, offended every turn back then, and now it's not. It's like every half turn we get offended by something. I'm kind of surprised that this show's even allowed to air anywhere. That's true. We are so offensive. I feel like it would be banned. Yeah, of course. If we were to get uh, a show on Fox, it would be first of all be the most boring show of all time. Absolutely, the, the worst sitcom, even even worse than that beer sitcom that uh, aired on YouTube for like half a day, making love in the break room. Yeah, would you like to make love in the break room? <laughs> I don't know if we talked about that on this show, did we? We did. Yes. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> it would be worse than that show. Oh yeah, except way more offensive somehow. Somebody would get offended by us. There's no way Married with Children works in PC culture. No, PC bro would be <laughs> totally flipping his. Oh my gosh, uh, flipping his ass. He'd Can be, you imagine current Reddit? Oh, okay. or Reddit with that being a current well, show. It depends. On, it depends on uh, what side of Reddit. If you're yeah, in, uh, if you're in the Donald of, of Reddit, Reddit uh, slash r slash the Donald, they tell it like it is. They're okay. going to embrace it and make it the nation's new slogan. But it depends. Uh, yeah, other parts of Reddit. Get on Facebook. It's the most tremendous show. Someone probably do a Facebook Live video uh, watching our show and commenting about how A, boring, and how offensive it is because we play fart drops. That's true. But, uh, hey, let's talk about more. Uh, Uh-oh. You know, we're in this uh, PC bro culture, and let's talk about a brewery that uh, may have violated may, maybe a le- legitimate uh, well, offense. Well, you know, it's less about the brewery itself than it is about the bro culture around beer because... Uh, what happened is there's a uh, there's actually a brewery called Mobcraft. It's a I guess a new and up and coming brewery uh, in Milwaukee, mm-hmm. trying to go against Milwaukee's best. I'm assuming Milwaukee, Mil- yeah, the good life exactly. <laughs> and uh, they had to apologize this Tuesday due to the fact that uh, they basically had an open competition among all their beer bros to say what what sounds like a great new beer name. So they opened this up, and one of the ones that actually ended up becoming a finalist was called Date Grape. Um, which you can't imagine what oh, na- that is. Named after Grape Ape, of course. Uh, of course, yeah. That's that's of what it's course. named after. The classic uh, Han- Hanna-Barbera giant purple monkey. It's just based on having dates and grape juice. Of course. So what would you possibly little, find wrong with it? A little bit of Jesus juice. Nothing wrong with that. You want to, you know, diddle up on some kids? Just give them some Jesus juice. Nothing. What's wrong? Why, why is PC Bro offended by date grape? Oh, I, I can't imagine why. I can't imagine what it sounds similar to. This is just another example of things that we've gone we've gone back and forth on about different types of beers. Uh, you know, even the Dallas Blonde goes down easy, had some criticism, and you know, there's just been different ones that have come out where, um, you know, it's just a little bit broish and a little bit anti uh, or a little sexist, and right. that that seems to kind of be a kind of be a thing that is in the beer culture a little bit. Uh, yeah, I think it depends. In the craft beer culture. Yeah, I, I don't think it's as big as probably some of these stories and the, the sure. Tennessee bro with their uh, their giant magnifying glass and their well, their hunter cap. Well, uh, I think I think it's not as big as they would have you believe, sure. but I think it's definitely an element for sure. Now, there's always the, you always got to play the line of, is it just being funny or is it being too far and being too serious? And that's, you know, that's PC bros area that uh, everything is too far and too serious. Sometimes you got to let some things go and, yeah. and some things are just supposed to be stupid and funny. See, to me, like Deep Elm's uh, exactly. Dallas Blonde, that's, that's not, I mean, look, people have the Grex. Right. Uh, that's not that, that's not really not that bad. I mean, you could, I know. you could easily say... A Dallas blonde. What about a blonde guy? A blonde guy could easily go down easy. But there's Why? a blonde woman on the can. I know, but maybe they should make a can with a dude on it. But, <laughs> but still, I mean, who cares? Even if it is just a woman, it doesn't really matter. Right, but it's... Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I guess I sort of understand, but, you know, there are people that are, uh, you know, easily will spread them or plant them or right. fist them or whatever. You know, it's it extends to both sexes. There are people that are easy. Uh, you know, sure. there's nothing wrong with that. If you want to be sexually liberal and... Uh, 
fling fling your parts about town, then go for it. But sure. that's not offensive. It, I think where this crosses the line is it's an act of violence. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, that's that's the thing. Is well, it's that's, making light of violence. Well, yeah, it's making fun of you know rape in general is not really uh, that's not the comedy series that most of us tend to go to. Maybe early break room did, but not nowadays. Yeah, of course. That was also the mid aughts, and it was. it was it was more okay to go but there it, back, back then. then. It was also we thought it was okay to call something gay. Sure, as, exactly. As an adjective, you know, and uh, some people still do, and some Neanderthalic people still do. That's it, true. You know, in it's and it wasn't like, of course it wasn't gay as in happy and it wasn't gay as in uh, you know describing someone as homosexual it was you know calling something disparaging of course and right you know uh, word shift it's uh, you can say that about any number of terms in human history about things shifting in meaning and of course uh, whether or not and, they should be offensive or not you know in 2050 maybe that'll be a thing that you can say again too I mean it's just or like maybe it'll rotate around and there'll be a new definition of everything and then that'll be an archaic term like calling. Uh, it's something bees knees these days. I don't know. Right. I don't know if you call something bees knees, but uh, it's just funny the way that language rotates around like that. And mm-hmm. uh, you know, I don't. I don't hold the uh, 2005 uh, like. What would be a good example? A uh, 40-year-old virgin. Yeah. The know how I know that you're gay segment. Sure. That was funny in 05. Of course. Uh, you know, I don't think Judd Apatow would have done that now. But No, no. But I, I don't think uh, people were as, uh, you know, uh, as sensitive to the subject. As right. Exactly. And I think we have a little more understanding and, there, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. I, I think the problem we have now is, and this is a continuing trend, and not just in beer, obviously, but uh, in media especially, is rape culture. And using rape for a um, a plot device, there there particularly was a big uh, brouhaha in the last week in Hollywood about how some executive I, I forget the exact story um, I'm probably gonna get completely wrong other than the fact that they talk about how in writers rooms it is a perhaps a story that it occurred yes how how in writers rooms um, rape is still a predominant or at least a consideration for moving a story forward that a woman is raped. And that is a problem. I mean, that, that's why is that the only story that can drive a woman's um, plot forward, as it were? And you don't really, they don't really talk about male rape, of course, or the, some other storyline. That and, uh, and and we saw that in, with comics a number of years ago. Sure. That, um, when the Green Lantern's fiance, I think, was raped and murdered and stuffed in a fridge. I mean, that was kind of uh, that was a big deal. And I think well, rape culture is sort of not not gone away in comics, but I think it's reduce quite a bit because of the fewer over that yeah i mean in fairness male rape is so much more rare it is. unless you're talking about like underage children or something right. like that yeah um so that's why that's not been used but um yeah i know what you mean i'm not saying that uh that should be a common thing if it's something that has come up on occasion i kind of understand just because that does happen but that shouldn't be like the that shouldn't be like the go-to storyline for exactly. sure that, that it's i agree what I, I agree with what you're saying that that seems to be like a fairly common go-to in the past and uh it seems a little brutal and over the top to be uh it, i don't know it's overused for sure it is i think it comes from this whole nature of uh historical nature of you know man has to be the rescuer and the avenger right and rape maybe would motivate a woman to be more powerful well there's a number of things that could make a uh motivate a woman to become more tough you know it doesn't have to be rape necessarily sure yeah as maybe if it were the occasional plot device I think it would be fine, but, um, you know, and, and conversely, we, we live in a society where uh, I think women are becoming more forward about their uh, sexual assaults and sure. they're becoming more vocal about that. I think that's a good thing because... Steve Cosby. Uh, yeah, exactly. I, I I don't think that's a bad thing. I think yeah. we, we should be sensitive about well, this. of course not. That's, a, and, that's definitely a good thing. And I think in this case, I think PC Bro is right. And a lot, yeah. of, a lot of times I disagree with PC Bro, <laughs> but I think in this case... PC Bro is, is is on point. It's one thing to be sexual. Like, there's, sure. there's lines about that, too. But, you know, a hetero guy is going to find a woman sexually attractive, of and course. there's going to be play around that. And there's nothing unnatural about that. But to take it to this extent, that's just, you know... That's, because this is making this fun is of forced. That. It's making yeah. fun of a forced, horrible act. Yeah, so I think, yeah. Like, like you said, the Dallas Blonde, that's a little bit silly. Uh, so it's not really that big of a deal. That's there's nothing forcing going yeah. on there. That's just people that do that kind of thing. It's, just, it's not so applying sexual. That assault. is PC bro going too far. But this one, uh, yeah, I, I'm I'm gonna go ahead and jump over with PC bro. On yeah, that one. like if they named their beer, uh, you know, Goofy Roofy or something. You know, right? It's, exactly. It's just, it's there's they cross the line to quote, to quote our mayor <laughs> Mike Rawlings. <laughs> exactly. His frequent slogan for Dallas uh, City Halls. That's all he says. Line. <laughs> Anytime anyone violates a law, that is a very local story. They just they play the audio of him saying that. You crossed the line. Every cop has to have that on him. Yeah, exactly. You were 15 miles over the speed limit. You crossed the line. 
Uh, good times. Uh, yeah. So don't drink grape rape. Or <laughs> <laughs> sorry. God. That's worse to live by. <laughs> or date grape. <laughs> right. But you should go watch an entire marathon of grape ape. Exactly. Grape ape is okay. Grape nuts are not so good. Grape Grape nuts are the worst of the cereal. Yeah. They're not the worst, but they're not oh, so okay. good. Okay, what's worse than grape grape nuts? Uh shredded wheat I think's worse. Hmm. You might be right on that. It's they're at least they're at least uh sinking to the depths together. They're pretty yeah, they're bad. They're they're both they're both plumbing the depths of uh of bad cereals, but yeah, grape nuts is man, that's right down there. Yeah, it's it's down there, for sure. Yeah, if you want to also have like a, you know, low rent uh Poncho's Mexican buffet blowout, you also eat some grape nuts. <laughs> It will it will get your colon moving yeah. if you need your colon That's moving. Right. It's gonna, Actually, Shredded Wheat will probably do that, too. It's true. They're both going to raise the flag on your ass. <laughs> That's for sure. But as always, the show is less about Shredded Wheat and cereal talk uh, than it is beer talk. Yeah, we should probably get back to, uh, back to beer and away from uh, farting. And, but, you know, intense social issues. Let's That's get right. back to uh, what we know, which is silly beer talk. And the question if we even know about that. But Let's uh, stay in your lane, Mark. Stay in your lane. Yeah, I'm going to stay in my lane. We're going to go back and take a little side trip to uh, Deep Ellum. We covered the Four Swords uh, recently. Their Cabernet uh, wine barrel aged whatever that was. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I forget which celebrator that was. Um, but uh, we talked about them recently. Uh, it's probably almost 10 episodes ago now. And uh, we're going to go back because they released a uh, a beer in partnership with Jameson, uh, the Irish Distillery. So we'll talk about Deep Ellum after this. When we talk about flavor, we typically think only of our tongues. But flavor is comprised of two sensory systems. The tongue, where we perceive taste, and the nose, where we perceive aroma. Thanks to our biodiversity, we all sense things a little bit differently, which often leads to a wide range of opinions on your favorite beer. Your nose has a huge influence on how flavor impacts you, as you'll notice the nose is influenced right away when your nose is clogged thanks to a cold, and everything tastes bland. Taste and aroma are best friends that give us flavor. The tongue only perceives basic tastes, salty, sweet, bitter, sour, and umami, or savory. This is where the nose comes in, because everything else we attribute to flavor, aside from texture, is actually aroma being perceived by the nose. Most humans have around 9 million olfactory neurons that exist between the upper part of the nasal cavity and the back of the throat. We're lightweights compared to other animals, like dogs, who have around 225 million. We use aroma to try to identify not only something good or beneficial, but also something rancid or unappealing. Aroma data is perceived by some of the oldest parts of our brain, from the hypothalamus, where we process appetite, anger, and fear, to the brainstem, which controls basic regulatory body functions. The nose has two sensor systems, the orthonasal and the retronasal. The orthonasal sensors are high up in the nose, and they're used to analyze, categorize, and identify aromas when you breathe in. These sensors come into play when you stick your nose up to that IPA and get a good whiff of that piney goodness. The retronasal system sits in the soft tissue at the back of your mouth and in the channel that connects your mouth to your nose, and it perceives aromas more as flavor when you breathe out, while food is in your mouth. The retronasal sensors are also connected to preference, familiarity, and satiation. When you taste something that reminds you of Band-Aids, you're seeing your retronasal sensors at work. As you chew your food, many things happen to release new and more aromas into the retronasal channel. This is why just smelling something doesn't reveal the entire flavor profile, and the two are sometimes almost at odds, such as being repulsed by the orthonasal aroma of smelly cheese versus putting it in your mouth. When you chew, the food warms up, you increase the surface area of the food, and things like bubbles are bursting, which all contribute to the nasal bouquet that is sent to the brain for computation. All that sensory data is then combined with taste to produce what we call flavor. So we talked about the Four Swords a few weeks ago, and we really enjoyed that beer at this time. And Deep Ellum is... And at that time. And at that time, and at this time, and in the future. We're not enjoying it at this time. We and, enjoyed it at that time. And tomorrow. But right. uh, they're one of the older Dallas Craft Breweries, starting in 2011. <clears throat> and Which makes them ancient around here. They, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Four and years ago. Four, four <laughs> years ago and four years ago. Uh, oh, five. Sorry. Five years ago. Yeah, five, math is hard. Yeah. Math is hard. The first old man was wrong. Second old man had the right time. Ah, screw the old man. He, he sounded the same, but it was two different guys. Screw the old. So last year, they did a collaboration. Jameson, the distillery the, out of Ireland, um, they did a collaboration. They made a, a whiskey called Caskmates. And they decided, uh, this came about because one of their local craft brewers decided they wanted they, to use a 
uh, Jameson Barrel to finish off one of their Irish stouts. And Jameson decided, hey, why can't we go the other way? Why can't we age our whiskey? <laughs> why can't we finish in them beer off? barrels? Yeah, why can't, why can't, exactly. <laughs> why can't we give each other mutual satisfaction? <laughs> Why well, can't we give uh, give each other the hange? Exactly, and uh, let's finish each other off in our mouths with uh, in our some of our, our barrel mouths. Yes, yeah, or in the bunghole of the barrels, as it were. Right, either way, whatever's open. So they decided to make a whiskey called Castmates, and then they turned around, and that was like two, three years ago, I guess, at this point. And then they decided they were going to extend the Castmates program to breweries across the. It was the two world. years ago. Yeah. Uh, no, it was three years ago. Well, I think it was three years ago. And then two we need to kill first old guy. He doesn't yeah. know how to do math at Somebody's all. Somebody's going to sound like a, a Maine lobster man. <laughs> From the 30s. Yeah. <laughs> Saying the bee's knees as it were. <laughs> now you lost that too. Hey, dame. <laughs> Shifting accents all over the place. <laughs> Just there's, there's no consistency. No. I'm not known for my consistency. I'm, That's true. I'm known, if anything, I'm uh, known for my inconsistencies. You are known for that. So last year, they did a program with breweries across the world, one of which was Deep Elm, and they sent them Jameson Barrels, the highly prized, uh, valuable Jameson Barrels. I don't know how many they sent, but they made a version of uh, Deep Elm did of their local legend uh, Milk Stout, in that they finished it off mm-hmm. in, uh, in their own mouths of the local legend. Which we cannot find now. No, it was very limited. We went to the brewery the day of they released it, and it was gone. Right. That's how we got there. So... This year, they continued that program, and they uh, decided to do a full-on, just a full release. Not just not just a right. range, just a full release all over Dallas. And they actually, you know, have some available for us to try this time. They did. Um, but we thought, we're gonna, that's what we're going to talk about today, is the Fascinating Bellman. It's the it's a Imperial Brown Ale that they uh, finished off in uh, Jameson Barrels. And But we thought we would start with a couple of things. One... They had some news out of Deep Elm. They got sold this past week, or they sold themselves to a. Um, I thought this was last week. Uh, invest, an investment group called uh, Storied Craft Breweries. They're considered a capital group, and Deep Elm is their first um, acquisition. They took like a, I think it was a fifty-six percent stake in the company. Right. And from from the rumors, and you know, it's supposed to help give them eight million dollars to continue to expand. Yeah, exactly. But the uh, the owner of Deep Elm. The, the rumor is he may have received somewhere around three to four million himself, just in his own little tiny pockets. Sure, for that stake. And of course, you know these these guys say this this capital group says that it hel- it will help crappers gain resources to expand without selling out to one of the big guys. Right. Of course, Mike, and that's fine. I, I I appreciate the fact that they sold to somebody like this as opposed to turning around and you know. Just clinching off and giving it over to uh, ABN Bev. Depends on what stored craft breweries does ultimately. Though. Exactly. It, they say they're not going to sell it out to an ABN Bev, but s- I just worry about that they're going to, because Deep Elm is their first. They're going to turn around. They're looking at some others, some smaller guys. I'm worried that they're going to turn around and then package these guys up and then turn around and sell them off to ABN Bev's for some ungodly number. And then you'll just have generic ABN Bev bottles of all these beers. Exactly. Exactly. And I start mean, feeding the beast again. We don't know that that's going to happen, but, you know, it's a concern. It's a concern. It's a concern, especially when you talk about somebody who's walking around and making a nice package of breweries, a, a portfolio. Uh, you know, what's their motivation to not sell out? I, I don't right. know. Other than I hope they have a love for craft beer, <clears throat> and that's really what they want to continue to do. Maybe they do. just make enough money doing that, and they're satisfied. That's rarely the case, but maybe that's the case. Yeah, yeah. How many companies do you hear about there in the public sector that's like, yeah, we're continued with the uh, you know the moderate growth that we've got. Uh, no, they more artfully do like want to cut staff. We don't even want to grow anymore. We just want to keep where we are. Yeah, it, exactly. They're always concerned with growth, not uh, maintaining absolutely a good product. So that that's a real concern, and uh, I hope that's not the case. But we'll see. Right. Uh, but today we thought we'd start the show with something a little different and start with a little bit of whiskey. And so we thought we would start with Jameson Caskmates and not the beer program, but the whiskey that they released right. a few years ago. The one that's in conjunction with the beer program, right. correct? Exactly. It's it's the whiskey that was released, I think, two to three years ago originally, after they got the inspiration from their local craft brewer. And uh, we'll see how it compares to Original Jameson, because I'm a big Original Jameson fan, but I realize it's not for most... Well, not for a lot of people, because a lot of people drink it, but it's not for most people. Because it's I not think for me. I, I think there are a lot of people, it probably tastes a lot like gasoline. It is a whole lot like gasoline to me. I, I admit, look, it's it's toxic, it's uh, it's harsh, at I feel like it could definitely strip it. paint if I needed it to. Oh, I'm sure it could. I'm sure it's not doing anything pleasant to my insides, that's for <laughs> sure. But uh, the, the bottle is different from a normal Jameson bottle. Normal Jameson bottles obviously just got a, a yellow label, green bottle. This one's got a little bit different. It's just a white uh, white label with the word caskmates on. It's pretty simple. Otherwise, it's pretty true to traditional Jameson bottles. I was going to say, the top of it looks uh, 
as I peer through your monitors, appears to be similar to the regular Jameson. Yeah, and uh, they basically took stout barrels and they finished off the uh, Jameson in them. Um, we don't know exactly how long or whatever or how long this was aged. Right. But we'll see. Uh, I know you're not a fan of original Jameson, but I thought uh, we would just give this a whirl. Jameson Gold's all right. You know, yeah, you start getting into the, the higher end stuff. Sure. The, the basic. I'm talking basic, yeah, paint right. stripping Jameson. <laughs> right. No, it's not my favorite. And we're not whiskey tasters. No, we're, we're not professional, but, you know, nothing wrong with imbibing once in a while. From a smell standpoint, definitely a lot less harsh, definitely a lot sweeter on the nose than a regular Jameson. But still very much very strong. I'm guessing that they yep. probably took their regular Jameson and just aged it for a few months in beer barrels. In, uh, it's, and specifically stout barrels. It's still got that rubbing alcohol effect on your entire tongue. That's oh, still yeah. there. It's very astringent, no doubt. Yeah. Um, you're right, though. The, the aroma's better. The aroma's definitely better than usual. Taste-wise, it's not as sharp as regular Jameson. It's definitely a lot more smooth. Now, <clears throat> it's no Macallan 18 or a Balvenie mm-hmm. or something like that. Now, I don't drink Jameson like you do, obviously. We've covered that. But is it normally this dark of gold? Or is it normally a little lighter than that? No, it's it's well, it's hard to tell. I mean, I mean, in this light, but it's um, it's about the same color. It's maybe maybe a shade darker than normal, hmm. maybe, but it's it's approximately the same. Okay, but it's definitely a, a softer, rounded, more smooth taste. Man, I feel like it is smoother though. It is. Sometimes it's, when I drink Jameson, I feel like I'm like my whole esophagus is going to explode from fire. Yeah, and this actually seems to be kind of smooth going down. Much like a deep Ellen Blonde. Exactly. So I would I would actually say this one's definitely better. Yeah, I agree. It's it's definitely a more well rounded whiskey for sure. How is it price point wise? Um this is a seven fifty and it was thirty bucks, I think, hmm. which is not, oh I'm sorry, this is a liter. It's not a seven fifty. Uh it was thirty bucks, not bad value really. I'm just uh, curious compared to regular, if it's a ton more expensive. Oh, you know, a, a normal Jameson to seven fifty were on you about uh about twenty bucks, twenty twenty five, depending where you are. So for a liter, you know, that's, Man, 30, that's not bad 30 at all. bucks isn't bad at all, 30 to 35. Uh, a normal 1.75 will cost you 40 to 45, depending on what store you're in. Man, to but, me, that's totally worth the upgrade. Yeah, yeah. it's, it's Five a, bucks or yeah, 10 bucks. Absolutely. Now, it's no Jameson Gold. It's no Jameson, you know, Rare um, or the Middleton uh, Distillery. But, you know, those are a lot more expensive. You're talking sure. Jameson Gold runs you about 80 to 100, depending on what store you're in. Uh, Middleton, Old Rare will run you, God, uh, you're just going 100 and, 100 and shooting up from there after that. Well, you know, it's just like the the Johnny Walker that we've had yeah, in the sure. past. Um, you get red, you can probably get that for, you know, 20 bucks, and then you go up to blue, and you're talking 350 Yeah, I think at least in this part of the world, Irish whiskeys are definitely undervalued, um, at least for some of them. You don't have as much selection in there. I think they're undervalued compared to Scotch. Um, you have a lot more like you go to a, a, a whiskey store here and you'll have an entire like three part cabinet of scotch and Irish whiskey gets maybe four to five shelves at the bigger stores. True. So I think they're definitely undervalued, which I think can be a re- you can get some really good value for that money. Um, I think they're just uh, way more ignored. They don't have quite the legacy that scotch does, but you can get some damn fine Irish whiskeys. So do you want to give this a rating? Sure. Even um, though it's a, it'll be our first whiskey rating. It will. It won't be our last because I think we're going to have one next week. I'm going to go with, you know, for, for I think value is a big thing here and for rounding out the original flavor. I think it does a great job at great price point. Um, definitely way less harsh, which, you know, turns around makes it more dangerous because you can drink a lot more of these <laughs> a lot easier. But I'm going to go with uh, four out of five on this because it's a great intro it's a great way to intro somebody to some base whiskey without being quite as harsh as maybe it could be. Yeah, you know, just kind of noting some of the flavors in it. Um, to me, again, normal Jameson, you know, after the first drink, first or second drink, and it's not really about being drunk, but just, you know, your palate adjusts a little bit. You can you can drink it after a couple of drinks of it. It's not as bad, but those first couple of drinks can be kind of harsh sometimes, at least for me. Um, didn't really experience that at all with this one. It was a little hot, but not too bad. Um, kind of that rubbing alcohol effect. Uh, there's just a little bit of it. Uh, re- regular Jameson has a lot of it. I feel like this does have like an oaky aftertaste, which is kind of cool. So you can tell you can tell it was aged in those barrels. Um, and that really comes through as you drink it uh, a little bit more. You know, after the first couple of drinks. Um, so I'm gonna actually, especially relative to other Jameson I've had, I'm quite impressed with this fairly baseline Jameson. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and give it 4.25 out of five. Look at that. 
All right. Well, let's move on to the fascinating Bellman. Uh, this is the reverse where they take a um, Imperial Brown Ale and they age it in Jameson barrels. So we'll talk about that right after this. Deep Ellen Brewing was founded in 2011 by Scott Freeling, James Peel, and John Reardon. They opened under the name of the iconic Dallas neighborhood in which they reside. They are also the first Dallas area brewery to be based in Dallas proper. They served their first keg at a local Deep Ellen bar on 11 11 2011 and have gone on to become one of the most popular Dallas area breweries. As of March 2016, they now distribute to all of Texas. They feature a group of regular beers including their Dallas Blonde, Local Legend, a sweet milk stout, Double Brown Stout, a Baltic Porter, Nito Bandito, an Imperial Mexican Lager, as well as a few IPA variants. Their signature beer, however, is still their 7% Deep Ellum IPA. This beer was first introduced in January 2012, yet it remains the best seller for the brewery. So the BJCP for a brown ale is that the overall impression is that it is a light-flavored, malt-accented beer that is readily suited to drinking in quantity. Refreshing, yet flavorful. Some versions may seem like lower-gravity brown porters. So there's not a lot of... There's not a huge distinction between porters and brown ales. I think sometimes they get confused. Well, porters, brown ales, and stouts all get get mixed up. We've had that discussion before on previous education. Previously on? Uh, Yeah, I, I think stouts tend to stand out a little more than porters and brown ales, but sure. I think the three of them, yeah, often get confused. And uh, look, I think all of us can be confused on some of these things. Now, the one we're doing today, Fascinating Bellman, uh, that starts off at an ABV of 7.8%, no IBU listed, um, so, supposed to be served in a pint or a shaker. We went with uh, neither today. <laughs> we went with a snifter, but, but you know. We like uh, to roll crazy, because this this, it's not just a brown ale. Supposedly, it's a, a, an imperial brown ale. Correct. But still, they're supposed to be in a pint and a shaker, apparently. Yeah. But that's okay. Yeah. That's it's okay. Imperial goes in a goblet. Uh, the commercial description is uh, oak smoked imperial Irish brown ale aged in Jameson whiskey barrels. So not not too much of a description, but gives you enough to say, okay, that's what it is. Well, let me let me read the side of the bottle here. Fascinating Bellman is crafted by history and true character. An aroma of bittersweet baker's chocolate and warm vanilla welcome a flavor of toasted chestnut. The sp- wow, that, this text is really hard to read. <laughs> The smoke character shows a history not to be forgotten as it fades right before returning with warmth. The resulting ale is fit for members only. So people and members only. Jackets. Like the jackets, yeah. yeah. Exactly. It, when they go jacket on. We are. We went jacket on today and we are this wearing is, our uh, our regulation Brew Bloods members only jackets. This was actually one of the coldest days we've had in a long time. It is. Normally, uh, every other part of the year, we go jacket off. It's exactly. It's too hot. Today, but had today, to go jacket on. Today, we had to go jacket on in our members-only jackets. Now, just a quick recap of Deep Ellum and what they're really known for. Uh, I would say they're most known for their uh, IPAs, their regular Deep Ellum IPA, which can be found everywhere. We discussed them before, so we're just going to kind of breeze through it, going to be breezy about it. Um, they're dream breeze, beautiful. Cr- exactly. They're uh, Dream Crusher Double IPA. Um, they do have a Double Brown Stout uh, that's one of their... More rated beers, not one of their highest rated beers, but one of their more rated beers. Um, they have their coffee ale, which Mark wasn't a big fan of, but that is one of their higher. No, that's uh, not true. I thought you didn't like their no, coffee ale. I like their coffee ale. I bought it on many mm. occasions. Oh, it was the cherry. It was the cherry that you did not like. No, I like that one too. I don't know what, what cherry chocolate double brown. I, no, there's one I of them like you that. were you were not no. impressed with. No, you're wrong. Okay, well, you tend to hate on them so much. I get it mixed <laughs> I don't up. Hate on Deep Elm at all. <laughs> but anyway, um, you know, so a lot of their stuff, their their main stuff, are their two big IPAs. I would say. Um, not that the other stuff is marginal. The blonde ale is also out there quite a bit. If you like blonde ales, it's everywhere, which, which is fine for a nice, smooth little blonde ale. If that's what you want, something yeah. real simple, it's not easy. Not a, not a blonde ale fan, so yeah, it's it's very drinkable though. I mean, like if you just if you wanted something that's almost water, uh, then you know it's it's a little tastier than that. Yeah, you could drink several blonde ales around the pool and be fine. You know, you could have probably a dozen of them, and be fine. Uh, not even have any kind of a drunken stupor or anything, but. The Dream Crusher IPA, as I said before, one of my favorite IPAs in the market. Um, their regular IPA, very, very good standard available IPA. So they have some good stuff. Um, now, we did do the Four Swords, which was a Belgian quad, which was remarkably good. Uh, not a Belgian fan, as has been well noted on this show. And I did quite enjoy that one. So I have high hopes for this collaboration between Jameson and uh, going ahead and mixing that with their beer. Maybe it'll be another thing, kind of like when they, uh, you know, aged their Belgian quad in wine barrels. Maybe or this may actually have something to it being in whiskey barrels. Yeah, absolutely. What, what are your thoughts, Mark? What are you expecting out of um, this? I'm hoping it's going to be somewhat of a departure from a normal brown ale. Because 
I think in a lot of cases, brown elves tend to be boring. They're very boring. I mean, they're okay. You know, they're, they're serviceable usually. <laughs> and a lot of times at best, they are serviceable. Not a lot of standouts in that category. Uh, that's where I'm in agreement with you on... It being serviceable, but that's kind of where I put the blonde ale as well. Like I think it's a, I think it's like a serviceable beer that you can get that's that tastes fine. I think it's one of those beers. That typically, it's just, if you're going to intro somebody to craft beer, maybe you want to if they like, maybe they like Guinness or something like that or right. a darker beer. They say dark. Um, maybe you start them with a brown ale. Or well, Guinness is dark. You know what I mean? Okay. Well, if it's you're a trying, light stout, but it's a stout. If you're taking someone from like a Bud Light, maybe you introduce them to a blonde. Right. Um, uh, if you if they really want to get crazy, maybe introduce them to a brown ale. But it's nothing crazy generally. There's not to me. There's not a lot of standouts. I think a lot of the innovation tends to be around these days. Uh, your farmhouses, your sours, your IPAs. Uh, I think even stouts get more innovative. I yeah yeah I, yeah because a lot of people do the imperial stouts. Right. Uh, Gozes. I think I think uh, porters, brown ales, red ales tend to be usually ignored largely yeah they're even trying to innovate the lager you know with black lager and yeah. you know hoppy lagers and stuff like that so yeah you're right I, I kind of feel like this one's kind of been left out and it's kind of a neutral a neutral base now just based on the ratings on this one this one's not very widely available yet or at least not a lot of people are drinking it yet because beer advocate and rate beer both had no score um and then untapped actually gave it a pretty high little rating at 4.02 out of five so uh you know anything that's over four uh, really over 3.75 or so is going to be uh, generally a pretty tasty beer. Yeah, I don't know how hard this is to, to find. We found this on Black Friday at Craft Beer Cellar, our uh, newest local craft beer shop in Lakewood. And uh, they had a very limited selection at the time. Uh, they had, I think, one or two bottles left when we got there late in the day. Yeah, and it was one of those limit one type deals. Yeah. So I don't know how widely available. I imagine it's pretty pretty good little limited because of it's aged in the uh, Jameson barrels, which is obviously you have a limit on barrels. Sure. That they're getting from Jameson's. I mean, the, the untapped reviews are only on 462 reviews. So right. not, not too many people out there yet. So the aroma for a brown ale is that it should be low to moderate malts and may have some fruitiness. The malt expression can take on a wide range of character, which can be caramelly, 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 grainy, toasted, nutty, chocolate, and or lightly roasted. Little to no hop aroma. Hence the no IBU. I think right now, I'll tell you this just uh, right off the top. This is a, smell-wise, it's a lot more deep than your typical uh, brown ale. Um, there's a lot more malt there than I would have expected. There's malt and there's and, a nutty aroma to it as yeah, well. Yeah, it's like a chestnutty uh, definitely some chocolatey notes there, but it's way, there's a lot more character to this than any, any other brown ale I think I've had. Roasted, nutty, malty, though I think all those descriptors work. I think the only one that really stands out as far as similar depth may be actually the other, the cherry chocolate, uh, uh, brown ale. Was it, uh, oh, that was a Baltic Porter. I'm sorry. So again, right. we're getting our, our beers confused, but Porters and, and brown ales not being that different, uh, really surprised me in its depth at the time. Right. And, and I'm seeing this again with this beer, and definitely a lot more chocolate. Now, I'm not sensing any Jameson-y notes, no whiskey notes. Nothing at all, actually. But it's a very well-rounded, um, definitely malty, way more malty than I would have expected, but uh, definitely a lot of nutty and chocolate there. No hop aroma for sure. Oh, no. There are no hops. Nothing. Appearance is definitely very dark. It is uh, it is quite opaque. It is thick-looking. Uh, it's got a booty on it, and it's got a decent head on it. Yeah, holding up the light, uh, can't see through it, except on the very top edges, which would be normal. But yeah, through the base of it, uh, or through the body of it, I don't see anything. No light. Yeah, a lot of a lot of lace on this, uh, if you tilt it side to side in your glass there. Uh, off-white tan head. Uh, you know, it's it's a brown ale. Nothing really stands out there, uh, other than it's nice to see a little bit of head retention there. Uh, definitely low carbonation, No, not much head retention. Um, yeah, so that's pretty normal. Uh, flavor uh, generally should be a malty beer, although it may have a very wide range of malt and yeast-based flavors. Uh, malty, sweet, caramel, toffee, toast, nutty, chocolate, coffee, roast, vinous, fruit, licorice, molasses, plum, raisin. So basically, there's a whole a whole rainbow of flavors that could be there. And light although, to medium body uh, mouthfeel as well. Although, again, as we note, I don't think there's a lot of... Uh, I don't see a lot of that in the brown ale True. category. I think generally it's just a, a malty, light beer. Yeah, I would agree. Wow. That is... Delicious, yeah, that's pretty smooth. Um, you definitely get a little bit of the the Jameson notes in there. You do. It's uh, it's actually not that unlike the Cask Mates whiskey. It's got kind of that oaky afterbirth to it, uh, slightly sweet. Now the weird thing is, the only thing I don't like about this so far, I'll tell you, is a little bit of metallic on the top 
of the, on the roof of my mouth. It's a little bit metallic, and I don't know what that is. I think it's yeah. this weird combo of it, it tastes somewhat reminds me of malt. <clears throat> well, it's got kind of like that uh, slight cask makes uh, cast mates cask mates, if I could say it correctly, uh, flavoring. On top of like almost kind of that plum raisin discussion they have in there, like I feel like there's a there's a sweet there's a sweet top to it, and then it has that kind of mixed in, and I, I think kind of the mixture of those two things does kind of put like just a, just a little twinge of metallic in there. Yeah, it's not huge. Yeah, it, it's not too bad, but it, it's kind of a weird combo to have something kind of sweet like that, and then also kind of you know straight up whiskey ish, and kind of mixing that. Like I wouldn't put the whiskey in the sweet category at all, so. You know, you're com- you're combining that. It's kind of a, it's kind of different. Yeah, it's not like death metal metallic. It's it's just a light. I, I think it's probably the the whiskey notes. Those more and Jameson, as we noted earlier, is very stringent. <laughs> they yes. base whiskey, and if that's what they're using was base Jameson whiskey barrels, it's going to be a little harsh. And I think that might lend this a little bit of metallic flavor to it. And it almost converts somewhat to like you know we talked about last week tobacco notes. Well, it kind of reminds me of of a little bit of tobacco. A little bit of like light nicotine bit. smoke in your face. I think there's a little bit of that. I think there's a little bit of raisiny taste to it. A l- maybe the slightest hit of caramel, if I think about it. But um, I, th- I think toasted, roasted, that kind of that kind of vibe uh, really comes out in this a lot. You get the barrel flavoring a lot, like you did in the in the actual straight up whiskey. Uh, that's definitely present. Um, no licorice, nothing like that, but. But it's definitely well rounded. I'll give it that. It's it, very. It, it has it, a lot going on. It, exactly. It's very complex. It's um. It's it's a puzzle in your mouth. Definitely. It's definitely way more evolved than any other brown ale. Um, I think I've had in recent memory. Which kind of makes sense because, like you said, um, take your my go to brown ale is a uh, Moose Drool as just my standard base brown ale. That's a perfectly fine drinkable beer. Yeah. But that is so. It, it's it's really plain and it's really kind of a blank canvas to work on. Mm-hmm. So if you add anything like this, you put it in a whiskey barrel and age it, it makes total sense it's going to take on the characteristics of the other things around it. It, it makes total sense. The more it, I drink it, the less I notice the astringency, the metallic favorite flavors fade. Um, but in what I tend to get more now is uh, cherry up front. Uh, a little bit of uh, almost cherry pie quality to hmm. that. Uh, so she is definitely my cherry pie here. But See, I, I get more, I get more nutty, toasted, toffee type taste out of it. I don't get as much cherry. So the more I drink it, the more toffee esque it gets to me. See, and I, I'm noticing more like almost. It's like if you took uh, took some toffee and topped it off with some like maraschino cherries. It's because it's sweet. Um, it still has a little bit of sharpness <clears throat> to it from the whiskey, but then I, I get it a lot of cherry in that. I guess we have reverse palates because when I was first drinking it, I got the sweet plum raisin caramel taste, but now that seems to be fading for me and I'm getting more of a toffee toasty type notes, maybe a little nutty. It's almost like we weren't born of the same mother. It is, which so, is weird because we did have the same mother. It is. That is very weird. And we were born yeah. exactly the same time. Exactly. We both exploded out of one vagina at the same time. Our heads came out at the exact same time. And it was probably quite painful. And we were also joined at the head, too. True. We were joined at the tongue. But for some reason, yeah. we uh, we have different taste buds. I don't know why. It's really weird. I guess you got we, the, the we nutty. came out with one large tongue just stuck together <laughs> exactly. that they had to cut in half. You had. I guess you got the nutty taste buds and I got the uh, more fruity taste buds. Exactly. Which you have always liked sweets more than I have, so that makes sense. Yes, leading to my more <laughs> my expanding waistline <laughs> and your chair growth, but that's another story. Yeah, that that definitely. Now, would you qualify this as just based on flavor alone? I don't. I, I, I don't know. I, I almost put at this point seven point eight percent. Is that what this is? ABV. I don't. Yep. I know it's not session, but I don't really consider it imperial either. It's almost just like it's a beer. Uh, yeah. It. It almost hits. Um, is Imperial seven or eight percent? I, you know, we talked about that once, and I can't remember the exact qualifications. But <laughs> we can go back and look at our. Education. I, I think. I think maybe technically it's definitely in the Imperial yeah. category, but I don't at these at this point where we're getting beers that are fourteen percent, fourteen plus percent. Yeah. Technically, over regular, seven is Imperial, by the okay. way. Okay, regularly ten plus. <laughs> yes, I tend to think of like those are big beers. This is just a really good beer, but I don't consider it a big beer. Well, if you have livers that are as worked out as ours are, um, then, you know, anything that's less than probably 10, we could drink a lot of eights, sevens would be fine. Other people may not be able to do that. Um, I think they're probably aiming that to the general populace that drinks standard like Bud Light that's four and a half Mm -hmm. um, or or less, actually. Um, So, yeah, it's not session. It's 
it is Imperial, but it's not high. Imp- it's like low end. It's like little brother Imperial. Yeah, like the little prince. Yeah, he's like barely. He just barely went into the Imperial yeah. category. La, La Petite Prince. And there's definitely no alcohol taste to this at all. No, it's not boozy at all. And uh, eh, whether you, I don't know. I, I almost feel like I would have liked to have seen a somewhat boozy quality of this beer. Yeah, mouthfeel. Mouthfeel, I think, is pretty good. Boy, it's it's uh, to me, it's drying. It's you like think? I, for me, it's a, it's like oh. evaporated completely. All it sucked all moisture out of my mouth. Wow, I'm not getting that at all. I feel like it's light to medium, like they like it's supposed to be. Like I, I don't feel like it hangs around at all, for sure. It's almost, it reminds me. It's not quite champagne, but it's very close to champagne. Hmm. It's like See, all, I think a Belgian's to me more like that. I, I don't. It doesn't have that kind of earthy drying quality to me at all. Yeah. Uh, Again, I, I, maybe this is what happened when we got separated at the tongue. I got the wet mouth and you got the dry mouth. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I, I don't know what that means or which one's better, but... I guess it depends on uh, depends on your lady. <laughs> All right. So ratings, Mark. Ratings. Okay, I'm calling this beer Amy Adams, and here's why. Initially, you don't expect much out of Amy Adams, much like a brown ale. It's kind yeah. of a blank canvas. You don't expect much out of Amy Adams either. And you, you want to have sex with both of them. Exactly, of course. I mean, <laughs> are they living? Are they dead? <laughs> Anything that's alive, you, you got to no, watch No, no, they don't have to be alive. Let's, let's remove that qualifier. Oh, okay. But no. they have the ability to have sex with. But initially, I mean, you think, like, initially I would have thought of Amy Adams like a Kate Bosworth. Amy Adams in the first season of The Office, by the way. Good point. Amy Adams, however, has surprisingly turned out to be a somewhat complex actress. A good actress. Well represented. A much better Lois Lane. Absolutely. The Out better, of the two options you just picked. One of the better lowest lanes, for sure. And, uh, you know, similarly, uh, Brown Owls, you don't think there's going to be much going on. However, Deep Ellum has managed to deliver on complexity here, much like Amy Adams and uh, many of her recent roles. And uh, surprisingly complex. And that, you know, that Irish Red, uh, the whiskey barrel kind of lends a, a nice uh, side to that beer. I think it's really, I think it's gone a long ways towards making a Brown Ale uh, more than serviceable. Uh, definitely more of a standout quality, much like Amy Adams herself. Um, this beer is not. She's a more than serviceable. More than serviceable. She's not a Kate Bosworth. I mean, come on. <laughs> Who is not, not serviceable? She's just a cardboard stand-up that uh, Kate Bosworth. Uh, this beer is definitely not my favorite. But then again, um, I don't reach for brown ales on a regular basis. You said that really Irish. Um, the beer is definitely not my favorite. It's not my favorite, <laughs> but it has a lot going on for it. <laughs> Uh, I would actually like to see this beer be, uh, surprisingly, uh, be a bit more boozy. Um, I want it to be maybe a big boozy broad, like uh, maybe less Amy Adams and more maybe uh, more of a Mae West type. How about a Rosie O'Donnell? Maybe, yes, a, a Rosie O'Donnell. <laughs> more, of a, more of a Mae West, uh, something like that. A uh, big boozy broad. Uh, I would, you know, there's not, a, there's not a lot of beers I just want booze from. I think actually, considering that this was part of the J- Jameson Castmates program, I think I would have liked to have seen more booze out of this beer. Yeah, I agree. But it is a very well composed beer. Uh, is very complex. You get a lot of different flavors from this. You get a whole Lucky Charms worth of flavors <laughs> out of this beer. I mean, there's there's That'd maltiness, there's maltiness, there's uh, uh, there's cherry, definitely. There's a little bit of metallics there from the whiskey. There's a lot going on there, and I, I can appreciate that. There's a few things I would have liked to have seen different, uh, just from my personal preference. A little bit more boozy, maybe a little bit more sweeter and less because uh, it's got a a tinge of sour from those cherry flavors that I notice, at least in my beer. Um. We shared the same beer, by the way. Well, I know. I'm saying it was my, one bottle okay, we in split. my mouth. We didn't make out with the beer and pass it back and forth. I just want to make sure people know we didn't get two different bottles. Yeah, it's no, one no, bottle no. we split. We did one bottle. We didn't do any swapping, mouth swapping. Right. Uh, we didn't. Well, snow- we did, but it had nothing to well, do with yeah. the beer. Yeah, that was snowballing. That was completely right. Um, but no, uh, just for the beer. No, we drank that our own selves. Um, some woodsy s qualities, which is good. I'm just saying there, there's a lot going on here, and I appreciate it. I just would have liked seeing a little bit more boozy, a little bit more bold, and a little bit more big. I don't know, uh, but it's very good for what it is. It's 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 a good beer. I think it's it, it's um, for someone who's looking to get something a little more adventurous. Uh, for somebody who's maybe transitioning um, to beer, not you know in life. Uh, <laughs> I was going to say, what, what does that have to do with it? I think this is a good beer to maybe uh, you know to get a brown ale to deal with your change in life. <laughs> if you're going through a transition, <laughs> try the fascinating Bellman. Um, no, I, I, I don't I, know if Deep Ellum supports that as a. Why would they not? Maybe not, but I'm just saying they're not saying that's the only reason to drink it. That's I guess that's I, I my point. I think they're gender positive across all the entire. Spectrum. You can do it then, but I don't think it's like specifically for that. Like <laughs> if you want to do it for that, that's fine. You don't think this is the official beer transition? <laughs> I don't think so. 
If you're getting an Audi, you're getting. We're going to make that today. It's the official beer transition. <laughs> the official beer transition uh, transition clinics across the world is the uh, fascinating Bellman. <laughs> right. No, I think it's a really complex beer. I like how much they've done, they've done to it. Uh, uh, and it, it was not who I thought it was, to not quote Denny Green. Uh, I, I like this beer a lot. Not my favorite. But I think they did a damn good job with it. Four out of five. So brown ales, in general, I would say are probably one of my last go-to beers. I think I would probably pick maybe uh, only a couple of different items. You know, maybe a Belgian, uh, maybe a farmhouse ale, and some other items along those lines. Maybe only those two uh, after a brown ale. So brown ale is probably what, lager. My, lager. Uh, lager. Yeah. Pilsner? Okay. I would pick this. Well, I don't know. Some pilsners. I'm not. I'm not against. Actually, I don't mind a good pilsner. Um, but brown ale's down there. It's down in the, in the bottom five of my options that I would pick. So bottom. I didn't have a lot of faith going into this or a lot of expectation. Again, Deep Ellum known for their IPAs. They're very solid IPAs, and they're at least very good IPAs at the, at the base. So the, this isn't really the realm that I like from Deep Ellum as much. I'm not against their other beers as much, but it, I just don't ever go for those. I just don't. Like, if I'm at the tap room, I'll try some of them, but... For the most part, if I find Deep Ellum, I'm looking for Dream Crusher. I'm looking for uh, Deep Ellum IPA, and that's about it. So I didn't really have high expectations going into this. Um, Deep Ellum has surprised me before. They have created the only Belgian that I've really liked. Uh, their Belgian Quad uh, Wine Barrel Age Four Swords. You can go back and listen to that, and I believe episode 62. I could be wrong, but it's somewhere in that. El- in it's almost that. like you may have looked that up on the internet. Uh, I did not actually. I'm, yeah. Well, I you know I was copying notes earlier, and I think it was from 62. But anyway, it's somewhere around that realm. Um, but yes, this is not, to me, brown ales are usually boring. They usually don't have a lot going on. They're fine. They're better. You know, if I'm out somewhere and I'm going to get like a Boddington's, you know, it's a Boddington's is better than uh, Bud Light. So, okay, I'll go for a Boddington's, but brown ales are not the thing I go for. That being said, I think they added a lot of complex flavors to this. Usually brown ales are kind of plain. They have a very distinct flavor. Um, and the base flavor is still there in this, but they've done a good job of rounding it out with some other things. Uh, the mouthfeel is really good. I think it's velvety smooth. Mark said it, dry, it dried him out. I guess since I have wet tongue, it did not dry me out at all. Yeah, you had you the wet tongue side of the family. Exactly. I, I did not find it drying. I found it very nutty. I found it very, uh, very smooth. Um, it has some of those notes from the castmates whiskey that we tried at the beginning of the show. Uh, the barrel is definitely there. You can tell it's got kind of a oaky flavor to it, which is good. Um, it, it has the like I said, the the brown ale characteristics with extra flavors. Um, up front, I got some of the sweetness that Mark did, but that tamed down for me and became more nutty, more oaky, and that and that kind of thing. Um, it's not too sweet, but it's not too bland either. Um, so it's really it's really kind of a complex brown ale, maybe one of the more complex brown ales I've ever had. Um, I didn't get a lot of Jameson notes in general, though, out of it. Kind of like Marcus said, I kind of expected some booziness, some 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 of that jet fuel just kind of sneaking in a little bit that is Jameson. Um, I feel like that was totally drowned out, but I know that that had an effect on the overall beer, so I am glad it's present. I just wish maybe we got a little bit of taste of that, uh, a little more prominent in the uh, final product. But overall, much like the whiskey uh, that we tried earlier, uh, I was very surprised by this. I was impressed by this. I enjoyed it. Um... And for me, my expectations being so low for brown ales, I kind of have to rate it a little bit in the category like we always do. Uh, we drink lagers. We don't like lagers, but we rate it against other lagers. I'm rating this brown ale against other brown ales. And for me, it's one of the top one of the top brown ales I've had, actually. So good job, Deep Ellum, in two categories that I normally don't like, doing a very good job at creating things that I actually didn't like a lot, that I did like a lot. So um, for this one, I'm going to have to give this a 4.25 out of 5. Giving us a final score of... Four point one two five out of five. Well, thanks for listening to episode 81 of the Brew Bloods. <laughs> That's Brew Bloods, <laughs> if you missed that. Almost got the show confused there. Uh... Uh, if you would do us a favor, uh, first of all, tell a friend. If you know a friend who uh, enjoys craft beer, enjoys podcasts, enjoys uh, hearing things, uh, point to our to show. We'd, we'd uh, really appreciate it. I don't know who that guy was. Uh, thanks oh, for listening. Uh, for that. Thanks for, for your support. Uh, thanks to those of you who have emailed us with you know beer trade offers, things like that. Uh, that's been great. Uh, we or got, just provided content. We got or a nice, just subscribed. We appreciate that. Or like Johnny B sent us a nice uh, bottle of handcrafted whiskey from his distillery. 
Uh, we would we appreciate that. Just go tell a friend. That's that's your number one job there. From? Uh, if, if you want to take on a second job, uh, go to iTunes. Leave us a rating. We'd appreciate it. Well, it's not a full second job. It'll only take you like a few seconds. Yeah, it's like a hand job. It's it's a few seconds. That's all it takes. Yeah, exactly. Uh, check us out on all the social networks: uh, Tumblr, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. We are Brew Bloods and all those. You can follow Dustin at the WS nine seven seven five, and I'm at the Mark with the C on Twitter. You shouldn't follow us there though. You should follow us at Brew Bloods. You should follow us everywhere. Including in real life. Mostly at Brewbloods, though. <laughs> if you have any feedback on the show, you can email us at brewbloodshow at gmail.com or you can call us at 469 573 That's 469 573 beer. Catch you guys next week for episode beer. 82, our Christmas episode. Probst. Probst. <laughs>